Hi, this is Fred Green, host of the Golf Smarter Podcast. Over the next nine episodes of Golf Smarter Mulligans, we're going to be featuring some of our many conversations with Tony Manzoni. Tony was an amazing golf instructor who passed away in 2018. We first met him in 2009, and in the dozen or so times he was on the podcast with us, emails flooded in with more positive feedback than any other teacher we've featured. So unless you're new to Golf Smarter or didn't play at College of the Desert any time since the 1980s, you've probably never heard of Tony because we were the only media outlet to pay attention to him. We replayed some of these episodes last year, and I still get emails today reporting on how well you connected and improved using Tony's teaching methods. Tony's book, The Lost Fundamental, One Simple Move, Better Golf Forever, which was out of print when he passed away, is once again available on Amazon, including the Kindle format. Tony's video of the same name was also out of circulation, but can now be seen online. If you'd like to gain access, please write to me directly via email, golfsmarterpodcast at gmail.com, or clicking on the Hey Fred button at golfsmarter.com. Lastly, after he passed we created a Tony Manzoni Memorial Golf Smarter Fund to benefit the first tee of Coachella Valley, which is where Tony lived for decades. Your tax-deductible contributions are greatly appreciated. Find out more at golfsmarter.com slash Tony. We hope you enjoy the journey and know that even if you've heard these episodes before, you're going to learn something new. Thanks so much for your support and enjoy. Welcome to Golf Smarter Mulligans, your second chance to gain insight and advice from the best instructors featured on the Golf Smarter podcast. Great golf instruction never gets old. Our interview library features hundreds of hours of game improvement conversations like this that are no longer available in any podcast app. I had a fellow walk in my office and tell me, would you like a copy of a letter that Ben Hogan wrote explaining how to hit the driver? He had some private film that he had taken and no one had actually seen a Ben Hogan swing. And I almost jumped in his lap. The first thing I noticed was that Hogan, on the top of the backswing, his weight shifts to the instep of his left foot. And when I read it, I thought, well, I think he means the instep of his right foot. And then I watched the film, and it was very obvious that he was staying on his left side, 60-40, throughout the backswing. And I think when you really center your head to the golf ball, you must be a little bit more on the left side than the right side. I noticed that his right hip was aligned on the inside of his right foot. And I just noticed that when he swung, he rotated his shoulders around his spine, and his shoulders really were more level than his earlier swings. And the film that I had was after the accident. And that's really when he said, I'm going to start playing off the left side. With another interview from the archives of Golf Smarter, here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome back to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Tony. Hey, great to be back, Fred. It's great to talk to you. How have you been? Well, I had uh, a little bit of a mishap. I uh, <laughs> It's kind of funny in a way. I broke uh, three bones in my right foot ankle oh. uh, by by falling uh, from a hill. Uh, I hit a wet spot and slid downhill, and body weight uh, went forward, and right leg didn't want to go forward, and it snapped like a twig. <sighs> so that's been, uh, it's been a little setback, but... Um, Other than that, life is really good. My golf team did well. Again, we won the 27th uh, conference championship in a row, which is kind of crazy. Each year, I just shake my head. I don't know why it it keeps happening, but it does. Do you recruit these uh, kids, or do they find you? I mean, you keep winning and winning and winning. Yeah, we get get them from all over. This year, we had a, a bunch of boys out of the country. Really? Uh, And some of them, yeah, some of them are really good players, and they're all coming back next year. Uh, But I I always say to them, how did you find the College of the Desert from Belgium? Uh, But they they go on the website, and if you look at the website, you know, our record really is is sensational. Uh, And then the area that we're in uh, is such a beautiful area for, for golf. We've got over 100 golf courses great weather in spring when we compete. Uh, we have a wonderful drive range on the facility. I'm a PGA member. I like to hope that part of them coming is my coaching. Uh, 
and, and just, the whole package is good for a young person that really wants to get into a, a, a golf in a serious way. So it works and, out good. Yeah, give and us more details. Gal- yeah, more details about yeah. the school, where it is, and so people can. Yeah, the, we're, uh, the name of the school is College of the Desert. It's in Palm Desert, California. It's a population of about ten thousand students. Uh, we have re- been rebuilding the college. It's built all kinds of new buildings. The campus is fabulous. And of course, the weather in Palm Desert or the Coachella Valley is second to none, and especially in springtime. So it's just a, a marvelous place to come to. Uh, you know, we we have a lot of we have the Coachella Fest and all kinds of activities for young people. But it's just a great place to live. I'm, I'm very lucky. I left the Bay Area, and you know we. We all know San Francisco is one of the greatest cities of all, all time, if not the greatest. That's why I, I haven't do, left. I do, <laughs> yeah, I, I do miss it, believe me. But uh, but for me in golf and, and what I had wanted to accomplish, this was the, probably the best place I could have come to. Hmm. Well, congratulations. You guys have just owned it. And uh, it, I think it's more of a testimony to to, to your teaching. Um, but even well, big- I, I, I hope it's part of it for sure. Uh, I, I have, I do have a formula that I use every year, and it seems to be working out. Uh, and I'm, and you know, the kids nowadays, uh, you don't really have to teach much when it comes to the athlete, the the movement of the swing. They're all pretty up to date on, you know, they're all in, into rotation and connection and so forth. So it's not a hard sell. <laughs> uh, it's not like it was, let's say, 15 years ago, where everybody was, you know, more of a hands and arm swinger opposed to a body swinger. So that part is really good. Uh, well, and we've also had uh, tremendous success. Uh, your book um, and the video, actually, the only place they're really available are on Golf Smarter, and it's amazing to me what a phenomenal response you've received from the Golf Smarter community. It, it is amazing because you know I'm, you know seriously I'm I'm a no name, uh, I'm just a golf professional, uh, although I think that I'm a pretty good teacher. Uh, and when I we did the book, too. when we did the book, I did it kind of for friends and family and ho- and hope, hoping that some people uh, in the golfing community would like it and accept it. And it, and I must say that I'm pleasantly surprised. Uh, thanks to your site too. I mean, you get you have such a a great group of people that are on your site all the time. So uh, that, that's that been a big plus for me. And uh, and I enjoy the, 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 the small success of people out of the country buying it, which is always kind of cool. You know? And all over the world. It's crazy. Yeah, uh, it's yeah. crazy. Well, let, let's talk about the book um, and what you cover and, and what your method is, because it's very effective. It, it, it is. Um, uh, you know, a, a quick history about... 15, 20 years ago, I had a fellow walk in my office and tell me, uh, would you like uh, a, a copy of a letter that Ben Hogan wrote explaining how to hit the driver? And also, he had some film that was private film that he had taken and no one had actually seen a Ben Hogan swing. And I, you know, I almost jumped in his lap. Uh, so I, I read, the first thing I did is I read the letter and the first thing I noticed was that Hogan stated that on the top of the back swing, he has his weight uh, shifts shifts to the instep of his left foot. And when I read it, I thought, well, I think he means the instep of his right foot because that's what all traditional thinking was. Um, and then I went on to read the, the letter, and it was really informative and a lot of stick figure pictures and so forth. And then I watched the film, and, you know, and it was very obvious that he was staying on his left side throughout the back swing. Uh, it looked like he set up a little bit like, so I'd say, 60-40. And I think when you really center your head to the golf ball, you must be a little bit more on the left side than the right side. I noticed that his right <clears throat> right hip was al- aligned on the inside of his right foot. Uh, so that was his right side brace. Uh, and I just noticed that when he swung, uh, he, he, he rotated his shoulders around his spine, and his shoulders really were more level um, than his earlier swings, and the, the film that I had was after the accident, uh, and that's really when he he uh, said, "I'm going to start playing off the left side." And the, the funny thing about that statement, the left side, a lot of people uh, say that, but they don't know what it means. It 
certainly isn't stack and tilt. Uh, a lot of people will say, oh, you teach stack and tilt. And I don't. And, and I'm not, I'm not uh, speaking against stack and tilt. Uh, I, I just believe that the shoulders really don't tilt on the downswing. I believe they turn based on the way they were set up at the ball. Uh, because when they tilt, um, it really steepens the swing and the downswing. And it also, uh, the, the hands must finish much higher and the body uh, ends up in kind of a, what we used to call a C position. And people that do that on, on, you know, do that a lot end up with lower back problems, as did most of the people from the era that I played in. Uh, so uh, I, I believe in, uh, in turning more level, as Hogan says, to turn level left and posting up so that when you, when you finish, your body's really more erect, and your weight is really on the left side, and you're not, your body isn't tilted back. Uh, and so when I got all this information, I started applying it to uh, some of the people that I taught, elderly people, uh, who their first complaint was, I want to hit it farther. Um, that seemed to be the, the number one chant that I got from everyone that I said, well, what would you like to do in the golf swing? Yeah, I want to hit it farther. So I started working with this, and holy mackerel, uh, because I had them more on the left side, I could get them onto the total left side. I get them through the golf ball much easier than when they transfer their weight right and then back to the left. And I readily saw that there was a rationale for doing this. This is, it wasn't a Band-Aid. But this was really the way you, you did it. And then going back into filming, you know, I saw the Palmers, the Nicholases, and all the greats. They had long careers. Their head was very steady. Their head did not move to the right in the backswing. So little by little, I started really buying into this. Then I got a call from Al Guyberger, who is a resident here, and of course a very famous golfer, Mr. 59, we call him. And Al said, you know, when I read your article in the golf magazine, local magazine, I thought you had flipped your wig. He said, but... I started doing it with a fellow that was reversing his weight shift all the time. And he said, it worked like a charm. I got him from falling back to the right side, and he is now finishing and hitting the ball you know, really, really great. He said, and then I started tinkering it. Now, think about this. Al Guyberger was voted as having one of the great golf swings of all time. And he said, because of my age, I can't get to that left side like I used to. And he said, it works like a charm. So that was the kind of the catalyst in the history of, of how I really bought into this because I had to buy into it just like everybody else. I, I was taught, you know, shift your way to the right, take your sternum and shift your way to the right leg and then shift back to the left. And, uh, you know, there's a big timing element there because you've got to make a little lateral slide and then rotate. Uh, and this eliminates that lateral side slide. So then, uh, everyone that I taught said, you know, you need to write this in, in some kind of a book form so other people can see it. And, uh, you know, they were rubbing my elbow pretty hard there. I'm the elbow, I mean my ego pretty hard there. So <laughs> I thought, well, what the heck, why not do that? So I wrote that little periodical, uh, small little book, as you know, but I think it's concise. And I have done this now since the day I got that letter. I have been continuous. I have never stopped doing this. And I can tell you that I have never had anyone say, I can't do it this way. I can't hit it this way. I think this is wrong. Never, not one. And I would, I would tell you, even if there was one, I would tell you. It's, ne it's never happened. And I've had a lot of guests, by the way, come from your site, your site that came into town to take a lesson from me. And I must say that uh, I, I got love letters from them after. Hmm. I've received those letters as well. I've had people uh, in the Golf Smarter community write to me from all over the United States and even outside, I'm pretty sure, who have come to Palm Desert in the Palm Springs area in Southern California to take lessons with you. And we're just, just so happy um, of the results. Uh, it, it really has been astounding, and uh, you can only thank Mr. Hogan because he was the, really the one that uh, I think there was other players that played off the left side for sure uh, in this era, and, and, and subsequently some that did after. I mean, Lee Trevino, in a conversation I had with him, said to me, I've seen a lot of 
uh, guys that had great long careers that played off the left side, but I've never seen anyone that had a long career that played off the right side. And I didn't understand what he was saying. And of course, like most people, I was embarrassed to say what he mean by that. Uh, but then after I got into this, I certainly understood what he was talking about. And it, it, no, no true statement can be made. Uh, the thing I love about it is that I get women and that have started to play golf later in years and also men and and they've taken a couple of lessons and they and i say well you know you're, you're really not finishing your swing they say well my pro tell me to shift my weight but i just can't do it uh, and i explained to them i said the reason you can't is because your body's in the wrong position in the, at the top of the swing you're in, you're in a place where you, there's no way there's no place to go but to hit off of the right foot throw your arms at the ball and and just hope that your your hands square instead of roll over and close or or stay open. And that's why a lot of people, you know, they slice a ball and then they, then they pull a ball. And they, now they don't know where to go. And it's just primarily because they've put the responsibility of squaring the club head in, with the hands and arms. And that is tenuous at best. When you do this system, you set up to the ball and you create your triangle with your arms. And you set to the golf ball. You rotate your right shoulder behind your neck, so there's no movement to the right. And what you're doing is displacing your weight behind your spine. And in doing that, the right hip and right shoulder go behind you, and you actually add a little bit more weight to the left side. Uh, the right arm folds into its throw position simultaneously as the right shoulder turns. So it's a real simple move. You're not trying to take it back low or do all these things that we've been talked about, or cock the wrist here, or don't cock the wrist here. You just take that triangle back with the rotation of your right side behind you and let the right arm fold naturally in it. That sets the club, and it's in your throw position because everybody's in a little different position. If I give you a, go- a baseball and say, throw it, Fred, you might throw it from a little different position above your shoulder or below your shoulder than I would, and we're all subject to that. So it's ludicrous to tell someone, okay, that you have to put the club here. Uh, because here is, it doesn't exist. It's depending on their um, anatomy. And then the next part of it is I, I don't get involved with where the club head is at the top in the sense of is my wrist flat or is my wrist cupped. I let the natural hinging of the wrist occur. Some people it flattens a little bit. Some people it stays cupped. What really matters is where it's at the at impact. And, and I find that, you know, Hogan cupped his wrist like crazy, but it impacts his wrist were flat. And I think that's really not a part of, of manipulation of the hands. I think that's a part of getting the left side out of the way, keeping the left arm connected across the chest. And let me say this, who, no matter who you are, if you're a right-handed golfer, when you take the club back, your left arm goes across your chest. So uh, that, that's not some trickery. That, that's the only way you can move. And when that left arm goes across the chest, it connects. It connects on top of the pectoral muscle of your left, left side of your chest. That's, that's where true connection is. So when you take that club back, the right arm folds, that left arm is stretched across the chest. Where that, che- where that left arm is, is, is setting is where it must stay on the first move of the downswing. That's why a lot of people used to put a head cover under their arm armpit or a handkerchief, that was to keep that left arm from coming down immediately in the downswing. Because once you do that, you are now subject to what your arms can do. You've left your body behind. So all this stuff about dropping the hands first, I, I mean, I'm not saying that you can't do that, you, but, but for the average person, they drop their hands first, they're going to just pull their arms down, and they're going to either hit behind the ball or hit it thin. And if they're lucky, they're going to hit it in the air, but they're not going to hit it with any force because they're only using their arms. They have eliminated their core. Where when you take the club back correctly across the chest, and then you rot- you start a rotational move. In other words, you're doing the opposite of what you did on the backswing. You turn on a single axis, which is your left side, and then you rotate around that axis. And that arm stays there. Eventually, the right arm straightens, the club hits the ball, and then as you rotate to the left, and you must, the club follows you back to the left, and the left arm folds, just like the right arm folds on the right side. So it's real simple. It's a simple, simple move. And I have people that come to me that are, you know, ones and two handicaps, 30 handicaps, and they, and they always say, what, don't I have to worry about this? Don't I have to worry about that? I say, no, you're hitting the ball great, aren't you? Yeah. 
I said, golf is like every other sport. There's a domino effect. You make, you make the correct move here, a bunch of good moves happen. You get in the wrong position. I don't care who you are. You're going to have a tough time with the game. I get frequent uh, questions uh, from listeners asking me about the book and the DVD that you have offered and want to know your response, which is better for them to, I always say just buy both, but <laughs> when somebody wants to, <laughs> when somebody wants to, to study more of the lost fundamental, um, which is the name of the book and the DVD, which are both available at, at, and our golfers smart at golf com. Tell me the difference from your perspective of what those two have to offer. Well, I think that we all learn differently. Some people like to see it, and some people can, when they read it, they can see it. Uh, you know, I, I I personally love the book because I can go back and I can put little yellow marks where I where I think it's important because I forget myself. Believe me, this is, you know, there's a science to this, and even in its simplicity. Uh, the, the, the sequence has to be correct. Um, when I hit a ball thin or fat, I know that I, first of all, didn't get past the ball. And that's one of the, uh, one of the things that I hear all the time. Stay behind the ball. Stay behind the ball. There's no sport that I know of where you don't move through a, a impact. When you throw a punch, when you hit a tennis ball, when you hit a baseball, there's a movement forward. Now, it isn't a straight line movement. But there's a movement past the ball for sure. You, you got to end up on your left side, so you're you're rotating around that axis, but past the ball. You want your right shoulder and right hip to go past the golf ball. You don't want to keep it keep it behind, and that's again what I see on the driving range all the time. You see people end up with their swing and they're, they're still back on their right right foot. I, and there's a couple of guys on tour that I won't mention that if if they understood this and got over a little bit at a dress on the left side. It, they wouldn't be hitting off that right side and all of a sudden hit it a fairway left or a fairway right, which they st- still continue to do. And these are unbelievable golfers that have so much talent and do it every day. Now, think about the average guy or gal. They don't put that much time in. They don't have the physical attributes that these people have. So how the heck are they going to play the game? Hmm. And that's why the score has primarily stayed the same for men and women with all this technology, new ball, all this stuff, scores are still really, really high. I've always had a wrist hinge issue with my my uh, uh, my left hand. I'm right-handed, but my wrist mm-hmm. is hinged. Um, I- I'm just starting to get it under control here. But I've always found that it, what it, the impact it had to, on me was that my club face would be open at impact, and so the ball yeah, would go right. Yeah, most people, ro- yeah, mo- most people roll their. Uh, it, it comes with a right hand grab. They roll the club open. Okay, now that's a compensation that has to be dealt with on the downswing. So mm-hmm. you got to roll the club closed, and and who can roll it open and close it and get it right? back to where they started mm-hmm. as they're moving at 70, 80 miles an hour uh, with a club, club head speed. I mean, it's just, it's, it's all silly to think you can. So most people that roll it open and then close and hook the ball. Uh, in fact, that, that's how a lot of people, when they want to hook the ball, they'll fan it and then close it. And they'll get a little, a little draw or, or close it quick to make it go around the corner. Uh, the, the correct way, I believe, is that when you, when you hold the club in your hands, your your right your left wrist should be bent and your right wrist should be flat, okay. And what you want to do is you want to move that position at least past your right leg in the backswing, and you move it with the turning of your shoulders, which swings the arms back. Now, if you do that, if you do that, if you get can get past that and just let the natural occurrence happen, what will happen is that the the right wrist will go back a little bit and fold down like you're holding plates, depending on how much how much flexibility you have in the wrist. And the, the left wrist will flatten a bit. It, it, may, it may only hinge like you were hinging a club towards your nose, you know, up and down. It may hinge or it may flatten a little bit. And that, again, depends on the way you have your hands on the club, flexibility of wrist, and so forth. And, and remember, the backswing is just... It's just the, the point where you're, t- you're changing directions. So it's not you take the club up to a spot and stop and start. That's just, you know, the golf swing is a continuous move. Uh, 
but but to start the club the club back, you need to start it back slow. Uh, it has to have a rhythm, but it has to be slow because if you start fast, two things occur. You, you're going to grab it with the right hand, and you're going to pull that right wrist back. You're going to bring that club back to the inside too soon. That's number one. And number two, when you have a fast backswing, you're always going to have a short backswing. Those two go together. Mm -hmm. So if you want to hit it a long ways, you have to have a wide backswing, and you have to have take time. As I tell people, if you're going to shoot an arrow with a bow, you got to pull that bow all the way back. Well, there's there's a time period to do that. So you see people with these real short, fast swings, they hit it nowhere. And that's the majority of people that play because they're not sure what they want to do, so they get quick, they get it over with. How would you advise someone to change their tempo and be conscious well, of it? I have a set, friend that I've been playing set. with. I've a friend that I've been playing with for years that stands mm -hmm. over the ball for almost forty seconds. He just stares at the ball, and then all of a sudden, if you blink, you miss the entire swing. It is so fast, <laughs> uh, and yeah. and he can't he can't understand why he doesn't get better. And it's like, dude, slow down. <laughs> well. Yeah. First of all, he needs to he needs to have a pre-shot routine where he starts in from behind the ball, mm. and then he he goes to the golf ball, looks at the target, looks back at the ball, and as he's doing that, he's aligning himself and calming himself down. And then to start the tempo, a good a good way to start the tempo is start with a, like your right knee, kind of a, a kick in. It just kicks kind of in like a forward press. And, but you really want your body to set the tempo. You don't want your hands and arms to set the tempo because they'll get out of position immediately. In other words, they'll get they'll get across you, and your chest has moved. And now, when your chest turns and your shoulders turn, your club's going to go way inside. So the sequence has to be a more one piece. Now, you know, I don't mind if the club head moves a little early, a little, a little first, but I like to feel as if. I set the tempo with the sternum of my chest. Some people like to set the tempo with their shoulders. But for God's sakes, you can't set the tempo with your hands because you'll start slow and then you'll quick, you'll, you'll yank it back because you, you don't, it just doesn't feel right. You, you've got to do this like you're winding up your body and not just taking your arms back. And that's the, I think that's a good thought is that a, a slow wind of the body so that you can really get coiled. Uh, and now you've got some room to create momentum on the downswing. How do you create the tempo uh, or set the tempo from your sternum? Well, I, I think about I think about my chest turning, okay? So I, I just think the center of my chest. So I, I connect my arms, uh, and so it, my arm, imagine that my chest is a picture and my two arms are a frame of that picture. I try to keep that picture, the chest, between those two arms, okay? And so I focus on... That picture, and I'm using this analogy because it's my picture. You know, other people might have, you know use their nose. I don't know, but I use that as. A, and so I try to keep that picture inside that frame as I turn. So in in doing so, I'm taking the address position, and I'm, I'm moving it to the to the right of me. Uh, and then, of course, then the right arm pulls and puts the club in in my throw position. But that's that's my process because I've always been. Fast. I've been a Lanny Watkins kind of backswing, uh, and it, 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 you know, if you have the talent of Lanny Watkins, you can get away with it. But I certainly don't, and most people don't. So what happens generally is you yank that, you pull that baby inside too much. You mentioned about putting the uh, club head cover under your arm. Made me think about uh, a, I don't know if he's a disciple of yours, but I know he's a fan of yours, and that's Martin Chuck of Tour Striker uh, out of Arizona. Uh, he's been on the show multiple times, and he developed the Tour Striker Club, and now he has a new product that this little inflatable ball that you can either deflate it and put under your arms, or when you inflate it, it you hold it between your arms so that they stay connected, right? Um, and he he talks about uh, he's been on the show multiple times, and and he talks about you and, and your methods. Well, you know, Martin, it's really funny. I, I was a member of, uh, I was given an honorary membership at a club that Martin was the head pro at here in the desert. And, uh, you know, I, I always try to stay away, uh, out of the way of the pro shop and all that because I felt a little guilty. I, I wasn't paying any dues. I was paying any membership fees. So I was always the back of the range when I played. And, and this happened late in my life, you know, so I wasn't a great player or anything. 
Martin, and I like Martin very much. He's really a gentleman, a really nice young guy. But at that time, we didn't really get social because I always, like I said, I always felt like, I hope he doesn't think I'm going to be trying to give lessons out here or I'm after his job or anything like that because a lot of pros feel that way. Martin, as it turned out, didn't have that kind of a thought in his mind. Uh, but one day he asked me if I would play in a junior senior event with him. And I said, sure. But part of me said, oh, man, I don't want to shoot 80. Because, like I say, this is the end of my golf career. So we get paired with two of the best players in Southern California. One guy's going on the tour. One guy just got off the senior tour. Hmm. That was the, their team against us. And we started the first hole and we tied them, but they had blasted their balls out there 50 yards past both of us. And then we, we had started, it was a shotgun event. We started on the, the ninth hole. And, and I, then it was like a crazy thing. I, I made a birdie on 10 and 11, part 12, birdie 13, part 14, had a hole in one of 15, Whoa. birdie 16. <laughs> Yeah, and I shot like twenty nine or twenty eight on the back nine. Oh my god! And Mark gosh. said, "What? What are you doing out here?" <laughs> Martin, <laughs> somebody should put up a plaque right now because a, mir- a miracle is occurring. Well, anyway, long story short, I think I shot uh, one under on the back, and and Martin shot two or three under on the on, on the on the other side, I should say, and we we win the tournament going away. I mean, it was just. It wasn't even a contest that two guys were playing with. <laughs> they, the looks on their faces was, I, at least I had it, that picture because it was just classic. And they figured, you know, especially on the first hole, if they drove it out there about 310 each and we're out there about 260, you know, well, we're going to get rid of these guys real quick. And as it turned out, we won the tournament. So, you know, Martin and I, we've laughed about that, that tournament. Uh, and the only time we ever played together, okay, and we've never really talked about the golf swing, but I watch revolutionary golf every now and then, and Martin's on there, yeah. and or, or on your site, and we talk the same language. We we believe in the same thing, and and as ironic as this is, is I hadn't seen Martin for years. I went to Lake Tahoe last summer with my gal, and one of my clients belonged to a golf course up there. And when I walk in, Gus Jones, who I know very well from the desert, is a head pro, and Martin Chuck is a teaching pro, and I just about fell over. So we had a big <laughs> laugh over that. But he's a great guy, uh, okay. really a very, very fine golfer. I mean, he's, and, and, you know, if you want to watch the play in the golf swing, just look at what he's doing. And that tour striker thing that he created is genius. It really is. Do you like that? Do you like that product and, and what it, uh, how it teaches you to come down on the ball? Uh, well, I'm sure I like it, and, and the only thing is, I will say that it's for for the average guy, it's very hard because the average guy doesn't do it right. Yeah, doesn't get you know, it doesn't. It, it, he's he's got that handle behind the club and it impacts, so the head's coming up, so he's not going to get the ball airborne. And I must say, the first time I did it, I just shot it down the you know about a foot off the ground. I thought, what in the heck? You know. But then uh, Al Geiberger was the first one that had had one, and he brought it over to me. Said, you got to try this. And then, I, and then after, you know, my, my correct swing kicked in, I started hitting the ball from here, and I thought, God, this is terrific. And, you know, it must be a good product. It's sold 10 trillion of them, I think. Oh. Yeah, he's, he's having fun so, with that. 